Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Side Talk. Tonight, I have Gary Serac. He is an author and also a financial advisor. And um, we're going to talk about his new book. Can you guys see this? My, uh, there we go. How to Retire and Not Die. And we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, what Gary has been doing. So, Gary, let me ask you, um, what did you dream of doing when you were a kid? Wow. I um, actually, I wanted to be out in the, old, in the Old West. I was a huge Old West fan. So that was, you know, I thought I'd be a cowboy. Um, yeah. Th then I rode my first horse and said that wasn't really going to ever happen. So. <laughs> oh, okay. Do you do yeah. anything now that um, coincides with that? original thought of wanting to be a cowboy is there anything in your pastime that you do I really like westerns <laughs> that's about as close as I get so but I still have always liked westerns and you know it's it's funny I um I, having been out in the west uh, a number of times I really like it out there but it's uh definitely would not cut out for that I'm I'm 100 percent sure of that so oh, okay all right. So tell us how you got into financial advising. Uh, totally by accident. Um, I was an English major. I went to Miami University in, in Oxford, Ohio, and I was American literature student. And that's what I loved. And I got out of school and realized uh, I couldn't figure out what kind of job I was going to get doing that. I didn't want to teach. So I ended up doing something totally different. And about five years after that, I was doing waxes, polishes, selling stuff on the road and uh, for auto detailing. But what happened is that my father owned a financial services company and sort of by accident, I decided that, that would be something I should try. I was kind of bored at the other job, to be honest with you, and I needed a change in life. And my dad was really in need of having some help and it worked out really well. So, um, based on the fact that your dad had this financial company, how would you say that you ma managed your finances before you got involved in finance? Ooh, I was always very careful with my money. I, I always valued my money. I always thought um, having some was way more important than not. And so I was able to kind of, I, I, I resisted the temptation to buy things just to buy them. So I guess I've always been sort of that way. And I still feel that way to, I, you know, I don't like to do things that are off the charts crazy. And I, you know, I kind of pay attention to the dollars. So what's the most expensive thing you've ever purchased? Ooh, um, I said it was going to be my house and, and it has been my house. And uh, fortunately, I won't ever exceed that, I guess, because I've kept moving up the, the food chain. And uh, yeah, so I think that's the most expensive thing by far. Okay. All right. So what do you think is the most common mistake people make with money? Tell me something for young people and something for older people. It, and it works for both of them. So I, I wrote a book called If Your Money Talked, What Secrets It Would Tell. And that was the first book I ever wrote. And that book was really about people who kind of screwed up with money. And I, I told stories. I changed everybody's name and everything so they couldn't sue me. But I really told their stories and said, wow, this is pretty, pretty bad. And, and the biggest mistake is, number one, they didn't have a budget. And, and that is such a critical flaw. I, I think if you're going to get ahead of the game, you need to know what you're spending your money on. And I can tell you that almost no one does. They spend it, they put it on their credit card. Most of them they don't even have a checkbook. They don't balance it ever. They have no clue where their dollars go. So that's a, a huge problem. I try and get them to at least write down everything they buy for a week. And I really want to do it for a whole month. And I said, I, I'd like to know what you spend your money on. So I will, I'll tell you one story. There was a client of mine. He always had a Starbucks with him. And I thought, okay, that's good. And we'd get together and, and he, asked, he liked to meet us. Well, it turns out he was seeing Starbucks seven times a week to the tune of about five bucks a crack, uh, maybe six bucks. So he was spending 40 bucks easy a week plus tips. 
And I thought about that and, and we went over that. I said, nothing against Starbucks because I actually like them, but you're spending two grand a year at Starbucks. And, and you really need to think about that because if you took that same 2000 and put it in your IRA, you'd have a really nice retirement start. And now what you have is a, a caffeine rush. <laughs> okay. So what is one piece of advice that most um, advisors give, but you disagree and share your perspective? So something that you hear commonly that most financial advisors say, but you're like, I don't really agree with that. <laughs> well, I, I, well, that's kind of easy. They're all about thinking that retirement is all about money. And I compete with financial advisors all the time. And what I will tell you, Keisha, is that the financial advisors I compete with are so focused on the dollars that they think that's all that matters. And I know for a fact that money is really important, but it's not critical. What is critical is what you do with the rest of your life, because you can have all the money in the world and have no idea what you're going to do, and you check out. So to me, everyone says, oh, it's all about money. It's all about money. How much money? I said, wait a minute. I said, tell me what you're going to do. Tell me what's next when you retire. And that's what the advisors don't do. They just look at dollars because that's what they're trained to do. Okay. So that's a perfect segue into your book, How... <laughs> how to retire and not die so you wrote this book what was the inspiration for this book and who is it for it, it is well the inspiration came from a uh, there's a friend of my father's uh, he went to high school with, uh, his name was Bruno and, and his wife's name was Betty. My dad was really good friends with him. Bruno was a very bright man. He created something that all three auto companies needed. Then he patented it. And then he made a boatload of money and then he sold his company. Well, we happened to go to, and this is early in my career. My dad said, come on, we're going to go have lunch with Bruno and Betty. I have no idea who Bruno and Betty are, but Dad said, come on. I said, oh, lunch sounded good. I was, that sounded nice. So we ended up going to Bruno and Betty's private club, which I didn't even know existed. And we walk into this house down in South Canton, Ohio, where I live in Canton. And there's more Italian food on the table and people serving us. And I looked around, I said, dad, where are we? He said, well, this is Bruno's club. And I said, does anyone else belong in it? Dad said, Bruno. I said, okay, that's a nice club. So we were with Bruno and Betty and he was talking about selling his company. And my dad listened and he sold it for gosh, like $10 million back in the eighties. I mean, it's for a lot of money. I mean, it's a lot of money today. It's a, really a lot of money back then. And my dad listened and we sat there and I ate and it was wonderful. And we got in the car and I said, dad, that was a great meeting. Boy, I love that. And he said, Gary, this is not a good meeting. And I said, dad, the food was incredible. He said, Gary, this wasn't about food. This is about Bruno and Betty. And I said, yeah, what do you mean? He said, well, they have a big problem. I said, dad, they got $10 million to figure it out. And he said, not going to help. He said, the man lacks purpose, passion, and a plan. And if he doesn't have it, we're going to be going to his funeral. Wow. And two years later, we attended his funeral. <gasps> oh, my gosh. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. So that was the kind of inspiration for writing this book. And I realized I was young. I didn't get it. But the older I got, the more I understood what my dad was trying to tell me. Um, and that's really what inspired me to begin to put this book together, which I did. So the audience for this book, would this book be for someone like me or is it for someone that's actually retired already or who would get the most out of it? Actually, I, it, it goes both ways, but what I'm finding are people that aren't retired yet who don't know what to do or how to do it are getting value from the book. And the value they're getting is interesting because I really give them guide rails and tell them how to retire, how to really figure out the next phase of their life. And that's what the book's about. And so I, I look at people, in fact, I was asked that question. I said, if you're 45 and you're thinking about retirement, you need to start thinking about what my book tells you because it'll give you some great tools to help you really figure a path for yourself. Yeah, I agree. I think that um, thinking about it early on and start planning for it makes sense. So you're right on, Gary. 
Thank so, you. Um, so what are the three major points that you want people to take from this book? Like if they don't get everything, what three things? Well, there's, there's the three Ps are purpose, passion, and a plan. And, and the three Ps that will keep you young. So the three Ps come into play. Purpose is what you do for other people, Keisha. It's all about that. And passion is what you do for yourself. I mean, it, it's all about how you take care of yourself and what makes you happy and, and what really gives you joy. And the plan says if you don't have one, you can have the other two and it doesn't matter. you got to take action. So the plan's the action step. And so I think all three of those fit very nicely together in, in one little package. Uh, figuring them out, not so easy, <laughs> uh, but that's what, you know, some of the, the tools that we give in the book, some exercises where, you know, I, I have one exercise where you grab a pan and paper and, and a glass of wine or whatever your favorite beverage is, and you go sit somewhere and you kind of meditate a little bit and, and begin to think about, okay, what makes me really happy? What do I really like? And what would I like to do the rest of my life? And it's an exercise and it stretches your brain quite a bit. Yeah, I like that. Because, you know, my podcast is all about passion and purpose. So, <laughs> yeah. Lines. Oh, well, we clicked really, really well at NPS because you yeah. said passion and purpose. And I said, whoa, that's my book. So, yep. exactly. yeah, I, one of the things I really do in the book is I, I try and encourage people to put together a wish list. And a wish list in my brain is it's everything you wish you were doing, but you were working so you couldn't do. And, and if you have a real wish list, and I have one, it's, it's about 50 rolling items. And I get something on, I cross it off, I add something new. And, and, it, and it can be as simple as, um, you know, starting a garden or, you know, traveling to Charleston, South Carolina. I, it doesn't matter what's on your list. It's just something that you want to do that you couldn't do when you were working. So what do you think is the biggest misconception about retirement and what is the most common mistake that retirees make? Um, misconception. I, I would say that I, the cover of my book is a man climbing a mountain. And when he climbs the mountain, I look at that. I actually did that when I was a kid. And you climb the mountain, you do switchbacks. It's really hard. I consider working the mountain. So you climb the mountain, you get to the top of the mountain, you plant your flag, you grab a cold one, you sit back in your lounge chair, and then you say, oh my God, what do I do for the next 26 years? And, and that's the real problem. So I think that's the crux of the issue. It's people don't really figure out What's next? And I think that's a critical flaw to retirement. I, I think it's so important. And my happiest retirees are people who retire to something, not from something. Yeah, that's good. I like that. And what do you think people, um, what mistakes do they make when they retire? Like, is there anything that you've heard and you're just like, oh, that's so bad, besides not having a plan? <laughs> Oh, gosh, yeah. Oh, so I, I can give you so many. It's, it's my office is kind of comical in some regards when people tell me what they're going to do. And I have to kind of bite my lip and not laugh. And sometimes I do laugh because it's kind of funny. But like I, I had a gentleman who lived in Canton, his family lived in San Diego. And he decided when he retired, he was going to sell everything in Canton and move to San Diego. Now, he had spent a week there, 10 days, and he'd go out every year and hang out with his family. And, and he loved that. Well, what he didn't understand is that his family wasn't really ready for him. And so he kind of invaded their space and he thought, oh, this will be great. I got family outings and the grandchildren and the kids. And it didn't go that way at all. Plus, he hated traffic in San Diego. He said, Gary, I'd be out at, uh, at night on a Sunday night and people are everywhere and they're giving. He said it was really bad. He said, I've never been honked at so much in my entire life. And he said lots of interesting signatures are coming out at me uh, out of windows and things and waving at me. And he said, I don't think they're friendly. He hated San Diego. And, and that's what he found. And he said he had no idea. He thought he was going to love it. And then his family was not all that excited. They liked him there for a week, but not so much 52 weeks. So <laughs> he ended up seven weeks later, he was back in Canton. He said, yeah, I, I made a mistake. I'm going to buy a house. I'm going to settle back. All his friends were here. It was a bad decision. Yeah. So do you, what are your thoughts on um, retirees buying um, you know, homes or, and things like that? 
I am a big fan of uh, testing the waters. So uh, lots of people move to Florida. Lots of people from Florida move back to Canton. I, I've noticed that trend. And, and they love Florida. And then they realize in August, they don't love it so much. And, uh, and then during the winter, it's really crowded. So, you know, you've got to hit your spots. So lots of people have done that. And, and I think I suggest, you know, please go down to somewhere, rent a place for a week, a month, two months. I don't care. Really see if you like where you're talking about living. And if you don't, certainly don't buy there and, and look for somewhere else. I, I have one client and he worked his way up the East Coast, went over to the West Coast, ended up in, um, gosh, uh, I think... Uh, Naples. And he just didn't know where he was going to go, but he kept trying different communities. And he finally said, you know, I really like Naples. And that's where he ended up. So I hear, I have heard a couple stories of people retiring and then, you know, passing away, unfortunately, and never getting to spend all of that money they so carefully planned for. What are, what is, what is your advice for that? I know we don't know when our time's up, but how should we live so that we can enjoy life while we're planning for retirement and things like that? Okay. So that's uh, really probably the most important question that people ask me about that because you, first of all, they don't want to run out of money. And I, and I said, I fully get that. And, but you also want to have a good life. And so what I've found is that, that when people retire, they have, and, and I stole this from a guy named Tom Hagner, you have go-go years, which is in the 70s, 65 to 75. Then you have slow-go years, 75 to 85. And then you have no-go years. And, and in the, in the go-go years, you're spending money, you're doing everything you can. The slow-goes, you kind of pick your spots, not quite so much. And the no-go, you just, you know, I'm not sure what you're doing, but not much. And what I found is that my clients who have kind of fallen into that mentality actually fit that model pretty well. They're, they're doing a whole bunch of stuff at 65, you know, going to Europe, going to wherever they want to go, doing whatever. And then by 75, they're in a lot slower mode. And by 85, you know, if they go out to dinner and play golf, that's a lot. Right. Okay. That's a great way to break it up. Um, so I know I had some something else to say when you mentioned that <laughs> I think I lost my train of thought um yeah. okay well what are your plans for retirement yeah I'm kind of semi so my idea of retirement a perfect retirement to me is one that isn't retirement I I like to have something to do I really like doing what I do so I I can't see quitting something that I thoroughly enjoy but what I have done Keisha is I've really cut my hours back so instead of working full days, I go in at 9.30. I'm out of there by 3.30. Uh, some days I don't go in at all. If it's really beautiful weather, I'll go something else. Um, I take more time off than I've ever taken off. And But when it's winter and I don't have much to do, I go work because I don't have much going on. But as soon as that's over, I'm, I'm pretty much cutting my hours back even more. And to me, that's a great retirement. Yes. I think so. I think it's so nice to have something that you're passionate about and you wake up every day looking forward to doing it and then you're still making money doing it, you know, so that you can splurge and go to Europe or wherever. Yes. <laughs> or wherever. Yeah. I, you know, my goal is I want to get on to Charleston. I, I, I want to go see Charleston, South Carolina. So I haven't done that yet. I want to go to Savannah. Those are places I've never really been. And I said, okay, that's on my list. So, you know, we'll do that probably this winter. We'll try and get down there for a few days. And I just want to check it out. And, and I've read about it my whole life. I said, okay, time to go visit. And again, part of working allows me the freedom to do that. And again, I can work from anywhere. If I just talk to people, that's what I do. Yep, absolutely. Well, Gary, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and sharing your insight. Please tell everyone where they can purchase your book and connect with you. Thank you. Uh, the books on Amazon and all the other bookstores that sell it, and all of them do. And then we're also uh, GarySurak.com, uh, G-A-R-Y-S-I-R-A-K.com. You'll find my website and some information about that. And if you leave me a message on there, I will get back to you, I promise, because... 
I actually do that. I enjoy that. So I get interesting questions. And then I say, whoa, I would have never thought of that question. I think uh, I'll come up with an answer and you engage. It's fun. Nice. All right, Gary.